what it do, my gang, my people, my rebuttal crew, my rebuttal family, how are we? My hiatus is over. We are back in business. Not only are we in business, our doors are wide open. Okay, 24 hours, if you will. I am Reb Maisel, as always, your host, and I am excited. I'm excited to be back chatting to y'all in this microphone and giving you the cases, the calamity, the chaos in the legal field. <laughs> do do do. Our tagline merch is incoming. I'm about to finalize or approve um, the final proofs, which is lit which is amazing, on fire. And then I can pull up to this show in a crew neck situation instead of wearing merch from other people's bullshit. <laughs> so fun. This light that's in my face feels like a little blinding. That's better. I don't know. What do we think? That is like like an alien race is about to touch down. That's what that looks like. Okay, we're we're lowering it. <laughs> um, hey, if you're not watching on YouTube, watch on YouTube. If you don't want to watch on YouTube because I'm just too stunningly gorgeous for your eyeballs, um, totally get it. ASMR, Hondi P. What else? Oh, I'm winning, um, or I guess like accepting an award in person this week from my fellow lawyers, which is kind of crazy um, because typically I just assume that everyone in my field uh, who enjoys me is lying to me uh, and they don't actually like my shit. And apparently they do. Apparently they do. Um, I am receiving an award called the Paradigm Disruptor Award, which only feels fitting, proper, correct. Um, so let's disrupt Let's keep disrupting. This case is is a lot of things, okay? It involves a lot of tomfoolery. It involves a family feud spanning the course of, como se dice, 30, 40 years. Yeah, which I love, right? The deep-seated stuff. The seeds that were sown a decade ago, several decades ago, a century ago even, um, and have just sprung to life in the form of thorns, weeds, poison oak. Okay. That is the type of family feud shit that I like. I don't fuck with the family feud stuff. You know, that's just, oh, like they were divorced and there's a child custody battle. Boring snooze fest. Okay. I fuck with a family feud that is succession level family dynasty type of feud. Okay. And this feels like very much what Succession was pulling from, right? The show Succession on HBO. If you haven't watched it, do it. I actually am totally uh, a fraud, a fake. Uh, I have not even watched it, but I know enough. I've seen enough clips to know the vibe, to know the jam. Let me know if you do watch Succession, if this case isn't um, totally on point. I think it absolutely is. This is not just one case. It is a collection of cases. When you have a 40-year-long family feud and billions of dollars at your disposal, you're going to get litigious, right? You're going to file some shit. You're going to file. You're going to retain. You're going to pay some billables, okay? You're going to put food on a lot of lawyers' plates. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is the U-Haul family dynasty. That's right, U-Haul. If you didn't know that U-Haul was a family biz, okay? A grassroots type of, wow, started from the bottom company. Um, now you know. Currently, now, and I guess for the past 75 years, U-Haul has dominated the do-it-yourself, moving, hauling business, okay? Of course, you guys probably, if you didn't know about this dynasty, you've probably rented a fucking U-Haul. I know I have many a time and hope to never have to do so again. Once you get the money to be able to pay for movers, let me tell you something. It It is the most first world privileged thing that I am so fucking grateful for because the amount of moves that I've had to do just throwing couches down 
third level staircases. Um, me and like my father, right? Like literally carrying shit we had no business carrying, tearing um, an MCL, ACL, a bunch of letters <laughs> along the way. Look, listen, look and listen. If you think it's a ripoff, it is like the most relieving thing if it's in your budget. I have been fortunate enough the last two moves I've had my firm paid for my moving expenses. So it's not like I'm just like, you know what I mean? Like wrap... <laughs> fucking rolling around in the dough here all right but just as an aside um yeah y'all should demand that if you can if you will it is the most it was the fucking greatest shit ever to watch other people move your stuff goddamn without even having to you know what i mean like bribe bribe all your friends to do a shitty job amazing currently u-haul owns more than 176,000 trucks 46,000 towing devices and 126,000 trailers Besides owning 812,000 rentable storage units and more than 70.5 million square feet of storage space. All right. Holy shit balls, right? A lot of stuff. They have a lot of stuff, a lot of a lot of shit going on. Now, that is what? 2023. OK, that is in the present. How 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 did we get there? How did we get there? How did we haul our asses there? Well. There was a coup d'etat. There was a murder. There was a fist fight in a board meeting. There was everything. This absolutely could be a biopic, 150%, okay? By the way, as an aside, I always thought it was pronounced biopic, okay? Until I heard someone say biopic, and I figured that probably makes more sense because it's like biographical picture. Uh, but I like biopic better. I don't know. Maybe I'm just thinking of the word biopsy. I don't know. I'm not a linguist here. Um, I just do shit, say shit the way it fucking sounds and spells and is spelled. So that is my very controversial opinion about the word biopic. Back on fucking track. What caught my eye to this saga? The only reason why I know that this saga w exists. These two headlines I breezed past, slammed on my brakes, flipped a U-turn and started my research. Okay. Quote, this billionaire led a coup against his father, so the father committed suicide in Las Vegas. And, quote, the long, strange trip of the U-Haul family, LS shown, once dreamed of starting a family dynasty, but now the business is sliding and the family has been rocked by murder. Let's do it. Let's lock and load. The call came into the red brick courthouse in Telluride, Colorado on August 6, 1990, shortly after seven in the morning. Quote, excuse me, my mom, I woke up. She's dead on the staircase. The dispatcher at the San Miguel County Sheriff's Office wasn't sure she'd heard it right. The voice on the line was that of a little girl whimpering something about her mother. Quote, she's sick. She's dead on the staircase. There's blood, okay? What is your name? Venti Schoen. I live in the ski ranches in a big log house. There was blood on the bed. Please send somebody. Okay, you said she's not alive now? I can't tell. The girl sobbed. Please send somebody. It wasn't the sort of call the dispatcher had come to expect. Not in Telluride, Colorado, the most secluded of Colorado's mountain resorts. In the summer, the town's population drops to fewer than 1,200 people, and locals tend to leave their Victorian homes unlocked while they're out. It's not a place where a child is likely to wake up and find that her mother has met a violent, baffling death. That was how Sheriff Bill Masters would come to describe what happened to ben Benty Schoen's mother. Baffling, unlikely, outrageous. That morning, he arrived at the ski ranches, an affluent development tucked among thick stands of aspen on a hillside above the town, to find a few neighbors and passersby gathered outside the $400,000 Schoen home. Inside, the body of 44-year-old Eva Berg Schoen lay at the top of the stairs leading to her bedroom. She had been dead for hours, shot in the back by a 25 caliber pistol. There was no sign of forced entry, burglary, or sexual assault. The family's six dogs had been confined to the basement that night after complaints about their loud barking, and the three children staying in the house, Benty, 10, her brother, Espen, 7, and a visiting friend, hadn't heard a thing. The bizarre nature of the circumstances wasn't lost on Masters, a short, sturdy Coast Guard veteran who had been Tetheride's sheriff for 10 years. This was his first homicide investigation. 
and he was dealing with an intruder who had slipped past dogs and sleeping children, apparently used a weapon equipped with a silencer, and escaped unseen. In Master's eyes, the killing was beginning to look like a professional job. But who would want to kill Ava Schoen, a native of Norway? She had arrived in Telluride from Phoenix two years earlier with her second husband and their children. By all accounts, she was a shy, athletic woman whose life revolved around her family and her collection of show dogs. She didn't appear to have any enemies. Yet Masters didn't have to look far for a possible lead. Ava herself may not have had any enemies, but she had married into a family feud of staggering proportions. Her husband, Samuel W. Schoen, 45, was the oldest son of L.S. Schoen, who had created a product as familiar to the American consumer as Coca-Cola and Kleenex, the U-Haul trailer. Trained as a physician, Sam Schoen had abandoned medicine after his first year of residency to help his father run the family business. He had abruptly resigned in 1987 and had since joined his father and several siblings in an acrimonious series of court battles seeking to wrest control of U-Haul International from two of his younger brothers, Edward, Joe, Schoen, 41, and Mark Schoen, 38. Now let's back it up, okay? Why is this a feud? Why do we care? Why in the frick frack paddy whack did the U-Haul trailer biz get so contentious? U-Haul was conceived by L.S. Schoen, okay? His name's Leonard. His middle name's something with an S. Um, instead of going by Leonard, he went by L.S. Every source, which I have like 85 tabs open, okay? And a book that I bought. Thank you. Um, everyone calls him LS, which is weird. Uh, I almost wanted to say Ellis, so I might just flow with that. Um, but it's literally L period S period to make it weird, right? Whatever. All right. U-Haul was conceived by Ellis Schoen and his wife, Anna Mary. The two met in Portland, Oregon in 1943. Ellis was studying to become a me medical doctor at the University of Oregon while Anna Mary Cardi, wow, I cannot speak. Anna, Anna Mary was a student at nearby Merrillhurst University. I am fighting for my fucking life over here with these pronunciations. Okay. Get it together. Get it together. Were you hauling? Were you hauling it together? Okay. I'm hauling. You haul, I haul. Then, at age 27, Ellis, who had earned the nickname Slick in med school for hatching money-making plans, got kicked out a year shy of graduation for covering an absent friend during roll call. Bummer. No longer in school, he was quickly eligible for action in World War II. This was around, right, 1943, 1944. Before heading off to boot camp, he married Anna Mary, cute, but he never made it onto the battlefield. He caught scarlet fever while training in Idaho, then rheumatic fever while in Seattle, just taking L's left and right. Navy eventually sent him to Corona, California to recover until he was discharged in 1945. Corona is near San Diego more so than LA, but it's like east of Anaheim. Amazing. None of y'all give a shit. <laughs> By then, the couple had a four-month-old son, Sam, the oldest son. And according to company lore, they tried to rent a trailer to move their stuff back to Portland from Corona, but had no luck. I wonder why. Is this a black hole? Is this a gap to fill in, in our capitalist system? I think so. On the long drive home, the pair dreamed up the name U-Haul and formulated a rough plan. The couple moved on to Anna Mary's family ranch an hour from Portland, Oregon, and began pouring their life savings of about $5,000, around $65,000 in today's dollars, into launching the company. Okay? L.S. originally purchased used trailers, but they broke down often and repairs were expensive. So he taught, so he taught himself how to weld and began building his own. He's a fixer-upper, okay? He is quite literally the epitome of, like, boots on the ground, American dream type shit. I'm gonna start a company and literally build it from scratch myself and figure it the fuck out, okay? Very much. Everything that I've read about him, he... This was his pride and joy's dream, and also it wasn't, like, his dream that daddy's money paid for. Like, this was his dream that he poured his sweat tears and life into working you know 18 hour days to get it going and keep it running and running every aspect of the business too like from start to fin start to fin 
just like to set the scene for you. Okay. So it's very much like a yay, clap, clap, clap. Like this sounds great story for sure. Um, you know, the type of American dream bullshit that you wish everyone could experience. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so that's why it kind of hits a little harder when you come to find out and discover and learn that um, he should have for sure put a condom on and maybe got off of his several wives and stopped having 12 children. Okay, I'm going I'm, to, I'm, I'm spoiling too much. We need to keep, we need to stay on track. <laughs> we need to stay on track. So he taught himself how to weld and began building his own trailers, all right? Then he traveled around persu persuading gas station owners to let them rent the trailers from their property in return for commissions, 25% for one-way rentals and 40% for local ones. The post-war baby boom was an ideal time for this business, of course. Okay, we're talking like, what, Mad Men era kind of? Maybe not. I'm making shit up. Roll with it. Economic prosperity and the birth of the Eisenhower interstate highway system sparked the growth of the suburbs and unparalleled migration by American families. U-Haul's nationwide one-way trailer rentals became an indispensable tool. And U-Haul entered the lexicon in the same way Xerox would later for photocopies and Google would much later for search. Okay, U-Haul sticking around. It is sticking. It was generally smooth driving. I'm sorry. <laughs> puns, punny, punny, pun, puns. It was generally smooth driving until 1957 when Anna Mary, who had a congenital heart defect, died at age 34. At the time, the couple had six children under the age of 13, already at six. Okay, six kiddos. Sace. And I'm not saying, I'm not judging, okay, for people who come from big families who, you know, whose parents were a part of big families. This was the culture, this was the time. Um, especially with certain religions. Um, if you are, for example, like I am from a Catholic, okay, grandparent type family, um, there was a brood and a half, okay? You had enough kids to be able to raise the younger ones, absolutely without a doubt. And there was a no birth control to be had. I'm not judging. I'm not saying that this isn't absolutely a product of the times. I'm just saying that, um, you know, hindsight's 2020. Hindsight is 2020. Um, if all 12 of these kids had been just, just amazing and just homies for life, for sure would not be saying it. I'd be like, what a happy fucking Brady Bunch type, cheaper by the dozen type shit. Okay. But this was richer by the dozen. Okay. This was, this was Billy's by the dozen. Um, and unfortunately, as you just heard, okay, first wife dies and they're at six. Our boy, Ellis, remarries uh, to, like, two more girlies, okay? Two more girlies, which is totally fine, totally chill. You know what I mean? Like, men can never hold down a woman for sure. Um, but, yeah, kept having a brood, kept having more kids who were half-siblings, okay, and raised apart from one another, okay? Are you catching this? So factions quickly began to form and divide. And our boy, Ellis, because he's a very nice, very good, heart heartfelt father, he wanted all of his kids to to have a piece of the pie, have have a piece of the billies. He was setting it up from jump, right, for them to to be able to take over this family business, keep it running the way it should, keep it keep it. You know, he wanted it to be family run, and he wanted to to provide for his kids and his grandchildren and great grandchildren. You know, decades, centuries into the future. Um, but you know, you you uh, sometimes raise a bunch of fucking brats. Sorry, not sorry. Some some of the best people in the world, very kind, nurturing, you know, heart is there, intent is their souls, uh, can raise fucking assholes. And, you know, not all of them are assholes. Even, you know, maybe not even a third of them are assholes. But I think that your chances of, of you know, raising some tom, tom fools, engage them some foolery, uh, goes up with the number of, of babies you're popping out. Maybe that's just me. Maybe it's just statistics. Maybe I'm getting better at math. Pick your poison. I don't know, but I'm setting the scene. All right. Okay. We're back on track. At the time that Anna Mary died in 1957, all right, we have six children under the age of 13. Each of these six babies, six children, inherited a piece of their mother's 50% stake in the U-Haul company, 
which by then had $6 million in sales, which today in 2023 is about $65.5 million from 22,000 trailers, all right? They have expanded violently, all right, rapidly. What They threw in like what, 50 grand is what I said, like a 50 grand pot to start this company, what, 10 years ago? That is obscene, all right? They're getting after it. Ultimately, her death not only shifted ownership to the kids, but also shattered the family. Fuck. Sorry, Anna Mar- Sorry, Anna Mary. RIP. Apologies. Um, for sure. And remember, she was one of the ones, or wow, she she gave birth to uh Sam, who was the oldest son, all right, in our succession roundup, who is uh, a key player because he is the husband of the woman that we heard about in the beginning who was unfortunately found deceased in her home. Let's keep going. A year after Anna Mary's death, Ellis, who was often on the road, married Suzanne Gilbaugh because men are never loyal and they don't grieve and they feel no feelings and they remarry quickly. Uh, I'm just kidding. Everyone's going to start going and yelling. I understand that men back then were basically pushed to get married, especially widowed men. Um, if they had children because it was seen as, um, you know, something that they needed to do to fill the gap in their children's lives and, uh, you know, kids need to be raised by the woman, the whole fucking shit. Okay. The whole fucking stereotypical bullshit. I understand that. Um, but, uh, still you're going to hear why this is fucked in a minute. A year after Anna Mary's death, Ellis, who was often on the road, married Suzanne Gilbaugh the much younger daughter of his neighbors. It was a sign of the times. Thank God they're over. Ugh. Ugh. Ew. Just to emphasize, a year after Anna Mary passed, okay, he marries the much younger Suzanne, And immediately sends his two eldest sons, Sam and Mike, then 12 and 10, to boarding school in California right after the wedding. The next eldest, Joe, eight, and Mark, six, stayed at home in Oregon where they formed a lasting bond. See, I feel like the blame put on Anna Mary, okay, for passing away, right? Like, oh, her death shattered the family. Let's maybe, let's maybe not discredit the men's role in this, right? The fatherly role in the fuck up, okay? The FRF, if you roll, if you will, okay? Um, Because, because, you know, let's, let's stop pointing the fingers, okay? And start pointing it at you, Hall. The... (laughs) Over the course of this marriage to much younger teeny bopper Suzanne, they had five more children and moved the family to Palm Springs, California, and then to Phoenix, where U-Haul remains headquartered. Are we keeping count? Are we keeping track? Amazing. The reason why I'm highlighting uh, Sam and Mike and then Joe and Mark is because those are, right, the the, the oldest, okay? Oldest, 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 oldest. Um, They are the ones... The finger guns are out and ironic, but yeah, they're the ones who very much because they fucking didn't get along and because their loyalties lied with each other, uh, they're the ones who kind of split the fam. Okay, split the fam a bit who who got into bop bop situations. All right. So really, um, are you following that Ellis? You know what I mean? His good intentions for the company. Um, and, and, you know, watching it all shatter eventually, um, y- you know, I-, I do have empathy, sympathy for for people who who get into a bit of a stitch, you know, or or very much when, you know, family um, family fucks you over. But this I feel like I could have seen the writing on the fucking wall. Right. We have Billy's Billy's being thrown at uh, 12 kids who very much are raised in different environments because of your uh, planning to send send them off to school in different states and separate them and also be half siblings from like several like yeah okay all right like it's giving hunger games billionaire hunger games the couple divorced after 20 years and ellis married four more times twice to the same woman okay so i lowballed him he married four more times shown gifted shares to all of his children over the years and owned none 
at the time of his suicide, which I'll get to in a couple decades. The wheels started to fall off the business in the 1970s during the oil crisis. Most of U-Haul's dealers were set up in partnership with local gas stations, which started going under at an alarming rate when they ran out of gas to sell. Many of those that survived shifted to self-service and no longer had the staff to rent U-Haul's trucks and trailers. In response, Ellis bought up, wow, in response, Ellis bought up nearly 1,000 buildings in 1975. Many of them cast off Chrysler dealerships and began opening company-owned locations. It upended U-Haul's business model and added lots of costs, both in property purchases and in hiring full-time employees. It was also the decade that several of Schoen's children joined U-Haul as executives, of course, okay? And, you know, to just to cut in one more time, lo siento, but like this is what we do here, okay? I give my rebuttals and, and y'all listen up. Silence in the courtroom. Thank you. Um, in one of my videos that went viral on TikTok, Ticker Talker, uh, I put, oh, you know, things that I've gathered as an attorney um, that you should know, but like I won't elaborate. Do not go into business with your family. Don't go into business with your family. Don't go into business with your friends. Don't fucking do it. Okay. And there's no asterisk after that. I'm telling you not to do it. Not because, all right, you shouldn't love and trust your family members, you know, right? Like you have them watch your children. You're very close. I am violently, amazingly, graciously, so gratefully close to my siblings. Um, my brother, Tyler, and my sister, Hannah, they are absolutely the reason why I am who I am. And I'm so proud to be their sibling. Um, if either of them asked me to do a joint venture, I'd tell them to fuck off. Why? Because I love them. I love them so much. Nothing good ever happens. I'm being so fucking dead serious. Nothing good happens. Okay. I've seen, I've seen hundreds, hundreds of, sh of, of implosions. And I have been practicing law for three years. Pardon me. That's right. Hundreds. Do with that what you will. Um, and ask any attorney and they'll tell you the same thing. Eh, love you so much. Back on track. Rebuttal over. Loud in the courtroom. It was also the decade that several of Shone's children joined U-Haul as executives. Many had worked for the company part-time over the years and were pressured by their father to join the ranks. Okay, so dad was like, daddy's money is going into the family. It's daddy's money. It's going to be your money. I'm going to raise some working fucking kids, okay, who are clocking in to my business which again, always works out swimmingly. Joe came on board in 1973, immediately after graduating from Harvard Business, business from Harvard Business School, from Harvard Business School. Joe came on board in 1973, immediately after graduating from Harvard, Harvard Business, business School, <sighs> where he'd written a paper on the economics of the self-storage business. Around the same time, Joel's, Joe's older brother, Sam, quit his medical career to come help. And Michael, a lawyer, gave up his practice to join U-Haul. Are we gathering the players here? Okay. Joe, Sam, Michael. I think we have a Mark coming in. Okay. The oldest. Okay. The ones who decided to, you know, obviously are the ones who, who turned the right age to get in first. Okay. I'm going to put up a little like doo -doo, of like who's the oldest and shit and like the two factions probably on this video on YouTube. So like if you want a vis, if you're a visual learner, fucking hit me the fuck up. OK, and go on fucking YouTube. Hey, Reb, cut out where you just slammed your fucking brand new iPhone onto the floor. Thank you so much. Whomst am I? OK, whomst am I? Tensions began to mount. Tensions mounted as the brothers jockeyed for position and disagreed about the best direction for the business. Sam, the very oldest, okay, the Harvard MBA boy, largely supported Ellis's efforts and was seen as dad's top choice for a successor. Okay, daddy's favorite. Joe, on the other hand, was fairly obstinate that the company was not moving in the right way. He wanted U-Haul to get back to the basics of running trucks and trailers he also didn't like working in the shadow of his big brother, so he quit in 1978, went to law school at Arizona State, and one year later opened Space Age Auto Paint, selling paint for cars, boats, and airplanes. He still owns this business today, 
U-Haul is a customer. Joe, with his younger brother, Mark, part of the faction who stayed at home in Oregon, remember, while the two oldest were sent off to boarding school, like, fuck y'all, the fuck? He also opened a printing outfit next door called Form Builders Incorporated. Yes, the FBI, whose main customer was U-Haul, right? So let's just form some fucking subsids, some subsidiaries, or, you know, some completely unaffiliated companies that just cater to your fucking trailers. I mean, it's a good idea. Like, this seems like a very good idea. You know what I mean? Like, look, I would proudly say that I'm a Nepo baby and I made this business my own because I wanted it to be, uh, my, to be my own money. But like, absolutely, my dad's my number one customer. Like, Look, listen, while Mark and Joe tended to their new ventures, Ellis began casting about for new revenue streams, setting up U-Haul centers where people could rent all sorts of items from motorhomes and floor sanders to jet skis and party supplies like dance floors, awnings and punch bowls. I'm obsessed. You're probably thinking to yourself right now, huh? Never seen a U-Haul that could do that. Yeah, there's a reason. As U-Haul lost focus... Its finances unraveled. Net profits sank to $9.2 million in 1986 and $2.2 million a year later, down from $42 million two years earlier. And debt ballooned to nearly $600 million. In 1986, $600 million in debt? Do we want to do the fucking conversion? I will. 1980 what? Six hundred, you guys, holy fuck. Six hundred million dollars in debt in 1987 is one billion six hundred and twenty one million six hundred sixteen thousand one hundred ninety seven dollars and eighteen cents in debt today in 2023. That feels irresponsible. But whom's am I, right? Like, I'm not exactly a financial planner, okay? People often mistake me for that. They think, oh, lawyer is probably responsible with money. You would be wrong. You'd be wrong. No, I'm fine. Like, we're fine. Like, I'm fine. It, I'm fine. But like, you know what I mean? Like, I, like I know how to run my life. I'm not going to run, run yours. But that feels that feels a little like we've lost focus. We've lost our direction. We've we've we need the map again, Dora. You know what I'm saying? Like Dora and Boots. Um, And what also like grinds my gears, what also oils my nuggets a little bit is is how do you get to that number before going, wait a minute, you guys? Like, I feel like there was a climb. Like, I feel like you didn't just go from like a million debt to 600 milli without some kind of climbing situation happening in between, okay? And I understand that the U.S. military is for sure an exception, okay? The military industrial complex is violent and thriving, but uh, they can absolutely, you know what I mean? They, they spend 600 million a day, but like this for a U-Haul situation for some jet skis and a dance floor feels like someone should have someone should have maybe whistle blown. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Okay, back to the story. 1987. Thousands of employees lost their jobs as a result of this clusterfuck of fucking bad decisions. All right. Worried that his father was wrecking the company, Joe led a coup d'etat, a coup. A coup, a coup, not a January 6th coup, a 1986 coup, okay? Joe led a coup of the company in 1986, forcing Ellis, then 70, into retirement. His father conceded the chairman's post to Joe as long as the oldest, Sam, Ellis's longtime ally and favorite son, stayed on as CEO. Ellis even threw himself a retirement party. Things turned sour quickly. And Sam, the oldest and the one who's supposed to stay on as CEO, quit in less than a year, unable to get along with Joe. And remember, okay, Sam was thrown into boarding school at age 12 while Joe was kicking it at home back in Oregon with the new young teeny bopper wife. Like, I'd have some animosity, okay? But whatever. <laughs> then Sam and Ellis reached out to Bear Stearns to explore options that would give the shareholders some liquidity. At that point, they had just enough votes to carry out their plan. Joe was furious, viewing their move as a hostile takeover. He countered 
persuading the board of directors at U-Haul to issue 8,099 shares on favorable, ter- on favorable terms to five key executives, which tilted the voting power to Joe's faction. This isn't allowed. You can't do that. You cannot pack the court in a private co- Like You can't fucking do that <laughs> to try to get votes on your side for something. You can't. Um, sorry, you can't. Like, you can't. Like, maybe you could if it was, like, written in the button. Yeah, no. Usually you can't. Usually operating agreements in companies, okay, will tell you that you can't. Um, and, and you're going to hear the name Americo. It's spelled A-M-E-R-C-O. It's basically, like, the holding company of U-Haul, okay? You're going to... Most of the lawsuits, the litig- the litigiousness, all right, that comes out of this is not like Shone versus U-Haul. It's like Americo, okay? But know that it's the same shit dip day. So these shares, okay, and this board is like the shares and board of Americo, which is like the holding entity, the operating entity of U-Haul. You get it. You got it. Great. Amazing. And mind you, right, when Sam left and when Ellis left... They obviously had shares in the company like they, you know, obviously were still breaking in the cash, breaking in the dough. They just didn't have as much, you know, running power, operating power as they may have had previously. Um, In response to Joe packing the fucking court, Sam and Ellis, the favorite son and then our founder, took U-Haul to court in 1988 to challenge the maneuver and seek damages, saying this is illegal. Joe then retaliated by canceling his father's lifetime employment agreement. This shit is shady as fuck. Like, that is lethal. That's poisonous. Like, that is dirty. That's mean. That is no love, no love lost, okay? His father, even though his father founded this company, okay, and may have run it into the ground, but founded it, okay, after he was discharged from the military, in 1947, okay, Lily found this bitch with like a couple trailers and a cute mom and a million kids. He founded it and obviously had good intentions for it. He didn't know he was running it to the ground, but whatever, okay? By stepping down, by getting out, all right, he got from U-Haul a lifetime employment agreement. So he would always get a cash. He would always get a check from U-Haul, which seems t- fair, right-ish? I don't know. A lifetime employment agreement, all right, from you all, even though he retired, in theory. At this time, also, all right, Ellis is like 70 years old. He's old. Like, it's not like lifetime employment agreement seems like, oh, like, like, come on. You know what I mean? It's like a gift. It's like a thanks, dad. Bye. Like, peace out. Joe (laughs) retaliated and canceled it. He canceled it. He said, nope. Terminated that shit. All right, take me to court, bitch. Like that, this is, this is a family feud. This is family fuckery. Ellis said at that time, quote, I'm basically bankrupt. Well, maybe not bankrupt, he added, but he was forced to sell his big house in Las Vegas. Once firmly in control, Joe and Mark Schoen instituted a back to basics approach, unloading the the diversified businesses, scaling back the workforce and investing 1.2 billion with a B billion dollars to upgrade the U-Haul fleet of 66,000 wow, 66, trucks and 100,000 trailers. In the last two years, or I mean, I guess in the next two years, after that happened, 1989, okay, uh, the company will have added nearly 5,000 dealerships, bringing its total to 9,300 independent and 1,100 company-owned outlets in the United States and Canada. But with respect to profits, okay, U-Haul was still kind of in the red a bit, okay, from basically claiming, okay, claiming that it's because of Ellis's bad past business decisions. Mark Schoen said, quote, at this time, 1989, said, quote, our profits aren't what they should be because we're digging out and paying for past sins. These past sins included the company facing several lawsuits filed by customers injured on jet skis all-terrain vehicles, and other products that the company leased during the diversification effort. Uh, people are splitting between two factions, all right? Basically, the uh, Joe and Mark faction and the Sam and Ellis faction, all right? Pick your poison, pick your team, pick your people. In 1990, the Schoen family feud takes its most vicious turn with the death of Ava Schoen. And mind you, for you thinking, oh, it's just going to end and like, oh, like someone could... This is not even the 
I, I'm not going to break down a murder case for you. OK, I'm going to break down what will eventually be a defamation situation. All right. Related to this family. Now I'm going to skip to 1993 for just a moment. OK, because in 1993, a very special book was published, OK, by a journalist, by an author titled Birthright. Murder, Greed, and Power in the U-Haul Family Dynasty. This book was published by Ronald Watkins, and he wrote this book by essentially conducting very extensive interviews with the very willing and capable Sam and Ellis Schoen. This was intentional. As you will come to find, this book is actually extremely fucking interesting. If I wanted to quite literally go line by line of each part of the novel, you would know way too much about this family than you ever needed to know every fist fight, every F word they ever hauled between at among each other. You will find out. I will not be doing that. Um, I did read this 425 page book, though. Um, I, 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 you know artfully skimmed it so that I could pull out the best the best parts. The prologue of this book is called Telluride. In late summer in Telluride, Colorado, the night wind rustles through the aspen and there is a soft whisper as it moves across the face of the mountains. The scent is a gentle fragrance free of all trace of human presence. On the approach highway, State 145, winding through the mountains just three miles from the Telluride turnoff are the Ski Ranch Estates. While it is not the most exclusive in the area, it is an enclave for the well-off, those who desire and can afford privacy. The houses are spaced far apart on Lawson Hill, and the graveled roads snake back and forth, concealing most houses from one another. On Sunday evening, August 5, 1990, Sam Schoen had unexpectedly driven to his other residence in Paradise Valley, Arizona to prepare himself for the next phase of the seemingly unending struggle for control of the multi-billion dollar corporation owned by the family into which he had been born. Left alone in their half-million dollar log cabin, his 44-year-old wife, Norwegian-born Ava Berg Schoen, sat with their two children, Benty and Eshpin, and the 10-year-old daughter of a friend who was spending the night. <laughs> Simba! Oh my God. All right. Ava raised Saluki dogs, and they were outside in the large fenced yard. Normally quiet, they were uneasy this night, and Ava could not silence them. Usually obedient and quiet, the dogs became agitated at unpredictable intervals. It lasted a night or two, then went away, only to return a week or so later. This night, she brought them into the house, but they immediately ran to the windows and barked uncontrollably. Finally, Ava gave up trying to quiet them and put them in a basement room designed for their keep. There, the animals piled together and in the comfort of the pack lapsed into watchless sleep. Ava put the children to bed in their ground floor room, then went upstairs to her bedroom and turned out the lights. Slowly, the house quieted as she fell asleep, alone with the sound of the wind outside for comfort. It was, she often said, much like her native Norway. After midnight, men entered the silent house and softly crept through the living room, then up the wooden stairs. They moved across the landing into the bedroom where they seized the sleeping Ava. As the men fought to hold her down, she struggled violently against her attackers. She was a slender but very fit woman and was specially trained to protect herself in case of this possibility. Ava fought without making a sound. A cry might have awakened the children and placed them in mortal danger. Silently, she extended to her children, their last measure of a mother's protection. She struggled furiously, bruising herself in her effort to escape, but it was no good. The attack was unrelenting, and she was no match for the men. Once they had her under control, there was no attempt to sexually assault her, nor was there a robbery of any kind. Everything of value in the house was left untouched. The men had come to take something else. At close range, a single shot from a 25 caliber handgun was fired into her back. She was carried or dragged herself to the top of the stairs. Then her killers fled as quietly as they had entered. After a few minutes, she was dead. Now, backing up 
to right before, essentially pre-coup d'etat, okay, of this company, right before, um, you know, Joe and Mark left and then came back to like flip everything on its head. Joe and Mark had always behaved as if they knew best, but from what Sam had seen, they actually understood very little about U-Haul. Sam had listened to Mark's braggadocio when describing his business venture with someone else, Dem Dennis Sabin, okay, his painting side gig, uh, and he simply didn't believe the figures that Mark was claiming. These were difficult times for U-Haul, but Sam had great faith in his father's business judgment, his diversification of the portfolio, okay, expansion into jet skis, if you will. After all, Ellis had built the company from nothing, and despite occasional missteps, U-Haul had grown repeatedly. By 1980, U-Haul's annual sales were approximately $200 million a year, period, right? Which, you know, if you factor in the $600 million in debt, like maybe not, not like great either, but neither here nor there. Who, who, what do I know? But more significant was the fact that Sam simply did not have the difficulty dealing with Ellis that Joe and Mark experienced. Sam and Ellis were buddies. Okay, he was the favorite son, buddy, buddy. Ellis was willing to listen to his input, though he often played devil's advocate. In the field, Sam watched his father run ideas by staff members at all levels, asking what they thought. Ellis was open to feedback and, even after he had launched a new program, was willing to make corrections or, in some cases, make one of his fabled 180-degree turns. It might not look pretty to outsiders and longtime employees found it disconcerting, but overall, his father's management style was very effective. As exhilarating as Sam found running U-Haul, especially in the absence of Joe and Mark, his fucking least favorite brothers, um, the real joy in his life came from his relationship with Ava and the family they had begun. Ava gave birth to a daughter in 1980, a child they named Benti, which was Norwegian for blessing. And in 1982, the couple had a son named Esben, Norwegian for strength of a bear and protected by God. Ava was a considerable athlete who jogged regularly and took her dogs out with her as well as to shows. She was an expert cross-country skier. And at least twice a year, they took skiing trips. She was a strong, graceful, and very attractive woman and was intimidating to a lot of men. Obsessed as a consequence, of course, right? When you're a woman who uh, is well-rounded, has it all, you apparently are going to really be too intimidating for men to handle, which is so, such a blessing, goddamn. In town, they went to dinner with friends and even with Joe and Mark and their wives. The truth was, however, that Ava did not like Joe and Mark, whom she called, quote, gangsters or the goons. As a European, she tended initially to be more formal and reserved in her personal relations, and their behavior offended her. Though she was friendly with all of her husband's family and socialized with the son's wives, she did not involve herself in family affairs or allow herself to be drawn into close friendships. Great, great judge of character, if you ask me. Great way to go about life. <laughs> Arm's length sometimes with some people. You know what I mean? There was an air of aristocracy about her, the sense that she had married the heir to the U-Haul empire. Her behavior toward Ellis was perhaps the most startling initially. Ellis was a very wealthy, powerful, and domineering man who usually insisted on having his way in business and his private life. The reality was that in much of his life, those around him fawned on him or fussed over him. Ava would have none of that. When Ellis, when Ellis attempted talking business over dinner, she told him firmly this was a family affair and business was out of place. Okay, so Ava was very clearly, um, you know, a bit of the oddball in the group. The one stirring the pot, if you will. The one disrupting. Okay? We love a disruptor. At first, Ellis was shocked by his assertive daughter-in-law and uncertain what to make of it. Ava could see the reaction her forthrightness had had and asked Sam privately if she should continue. Sam assured her that his father preferred straight talk and that he, Sam, loved her for daring to engage in it. He was right. Ellis soon came to appreciate Ava's direct manner and had to concede she had a point. He did mix business and family too often. Snaps can like get the hint okay she was trying to tell you for real ava's disregard for joe was keenly returned he fucking hated her too <laughs> behind her back but in her presence joe called the elegant and graceful ava quote horsey the moose that telephone pole or with a snicker the big swede it's giving slur okay it's giving deserves to be talking sternly to Joe was not alone. Paul appeared to hold a similar hostile attitude toward his brother's wife. Sam commented once that there was something he needed to do, and Paul responded with a sneer, quote, you have your tall, blonde Norwegian to do that for you, end quote. 
ugh, ugh. See, I know that this book is like skewed for sure, skewed. You know what I mean? Like definitely skewed, but like I'm on their side. <laughs> like I'm, I'm Team Sam right now. I am Team Sam. I am that camp currently, presently. <laughs> The closeness of Sam and Ava and the love between them were so apparent, people commented on it routinely. Ava possessed a spontaneous, deft sense of humor that filled the outgoing Sam with roaring laughter. Whenever he was in her presence, she was the focus of his attention, and when she spoke, he clung to every word. By comparison, Joe and his wife Heidi were not doing well. Oh, it's giving jealous. It's giving you want what your brother has. Okay, word. While Heidi spoke with pride of her husband, he had, after all, gone on to obtain his law degree and insisted at family gatherings that Joe was every bit the businessman that his father was, the intention between the couple was clear to see. To some of those who knew both couples, it was obvious that Heidi was jealous of Ava, especially of her relationship with Sam. Their house was divided into Joe's space and Heidi's space. Heidi's area was immaculate, so formal and stiff that any thought of spontaneity was crushed. Joe's area was as it had been when he was a bachelor, with biker paraphernalia scattered everywhere, leather and chains, gross drawings of scraggly men and buxom women on chopped motorcycles, and a t-shirt with a German iron cross, skull and crossbones, and the words, love is hate, hate is love. Joe placated Heidi by buying her what she wanted from time to time. One day from when Ellis was visiting, Heidi gave him a tour of the small house, pointing out each of the acquisitions she believed were intended to keep her satisfied by saying, quote, there is a bribe from Joe then pointing to another with the same words. By 1987, the family drama was was being stirred at a boiling rapid pace, okay? Essentially, Ellis and Joe and Mark and Sam and crew, uh, they, okay, because before cell phones, um, before email, um, but not before telephones, I guess they just didn't really want to hear each other's voices. Um, they would write each other's letters, okay? Extensive letters, um, yelling letters, Cuss, cussing out fuck you letters okay go fuck yourself you're not taking my money type letters all right between each other among each other and they kept them all of course they kept them all okay in 1987 ellis's frustration was only growing he sent one letter to joe uh with copies to all the other children that said quote joe this letter is not an attack on you your behavior is destructive, not constructive. Your problem is fear. This is probably engendered by the loss of your mother when you were still a child. This fear has made and makes you very insecure. Your security became U-Haul. Your fear manifests itself in anger and attacks upon whoever you believe is threatening U-Haul. For 15 pages, Ellis, Joe's father, offered his version of Joe's life history. Mark shares many, quote, Mark shares many of your behavior patterns. Like, you guys, this is obscene. Imagine your dad, okay, let me just like preface this. Imagine you have 12 siblings, okay? 11 siblings, you're 12, okay? You have 11 siblings. Your dad writes this scathing letter to you, basically trying to unpack why the fuck you, you, everything wrong with you unpack why you, you you everything is wrong with you just like shitting on you and the way that parents do and do right inaccurately all the fucking just have you fuming okay but instead of just sending this letter to you he sends a copy to all of your siblings this letter about you okay i know i already said that but just like to lean into it more okay this family was diabolical on every side of the fucking fence OK, I can also understand why he's fucked up. OK, fuck. Quote from his dad, quote. Mark shares many of your behavior patterns. <laughs> Mark, his brother. OK, Joe and Mark and their camp. OK, Sam and Ellis and another. You learn to do this as children. This aggression is probably in your genes as well as your experience after your mother's death. Like keep bringing that up. Obsessed with that. You and Mark talk and behave as if this organization was your personal kingdom and that you can do with its people and property as you damn well please. You even try to make me and others think that my, Ellis's, mine is incapable of functioning properly because at this point, Joe and Mark were stirring the plot and the pot, wow, stirring the pot, planting seeds of rumors, but not really rumors, just like blatantly saying it, that their father was mentally ill. They were like, he's mentally ill, he's insane, he's senile, he's losing his mind. Like, that's why he's saying all this shit. Okay. So his dad says, you even try to make me and others think that my mind is incapable of functioning properly, that I should not work. You have secretly told outright lies about me. 
Ellis asked for Joe's resignation from the board. He reminded Joe that he had promised to support Sam. Instead, he had worked against him. Quote, you did this in a devious and manipulative way. No large and complex organization can long endure under the environment that you create. You are lust for power and greed blind you. As I told you, I will not and cannot rest until you are out of power in this organization to see it as a part of your everyday life. You are a con man. I am ashamed as to the part I played at the shareholders meeting last year. I feel like my nose is a foot long. To his other children, in this letter to Joe that he just, right, sent a copy to everyone about, he basically in the letter was like, okay, now to the other kids, even though Joe's going to read every word, Ellis, the dad, the patriarch says, quote, it is difficult for me to believe that you can trust Joe as opposed to me. Because remember, all of the other 11 kids are all have a stake in this company. Like they're all doing the dirty, okay? They're all, they all got a piece of the pie, Okay. The multi-billion dollar pie, dollar pie. Okay, so their vote matters. Their their positions matter. Their executive, like you get it. Okay, he says it is difficult for me to believe that you can trust Joe as opposed to me. Think carefully. There has been and will be no peace otherwise. Not for me, nor for you. You can take that to the bank. End quote. July 7th, 1987, Joe called his father and renewed his accusation that Ellis had turned him into the IRS. He claimed further that Ellis had broken into his office. Quote: It was a mistake. You got it. Joe said threateningly. Well, Joe, Ellis began before he could finish. Joe shouted into the telephone, quote, you fucked yourself. You just did it, asshole. You just admitted it. Admitted what? That you hired people on me and I knew you had been. You dirty cocksucker. Ellis. Yes, I have. You fucked yourself. Joe said, fuck yourself. You got it straight. Can I help you with it? You fuck yourself. I ain't your kid. You fuck yourself. You hire people on me. You fuck yourself. Joe hung up. Right. July 14th of 1987, Sam was at the headquarters stuffing envelopes when Joe and Mark entered the office and closed the door behind them. They launched into a verbal attack against Sam that grew into hostility. Finally, Sam asked Mark if he if what he wanted was a fight, to which Mark replied, OK. Sam stood up and said, then let's get it on. They started fist fighting. <laughs> I'm not laughing. It's not funny, but like very quickly after the fist fight started, Sam had the upper hand. Then Joe jumped Sam from behind wrestled him to the floor and held him down as Mark kicked him in the head. John Dodds, an employee, heard the commotion and broke it up. Employees watched as he shoveled Sam with a bloody torn shirt leave the building. Joe's and Mark's version was, of course, different than Sam's, and they were very concerned about how the assault would be interpreted. As part of damage control, Mark wrote his brother, quote, Dear Sam, your letter to Joe describing our little disagreement Tuesday, 14th of July, is certainly amusing. In fact, had I not been in the room at the time, I might even believe you. I'm sure your letter is intended for general distribution prior to the shareholders meeting. For this reason, I will attempt to jog your memory so that at least you know that you are lying. You, Sam, are a premeditating, sucker-punching, ball-busting, eye-gouging asshole. You do tell a good story and no doubt are proud of it. Let me be real clear. The next time you sucker-punch me, at least do the job right. Hit me with the first punch or don't start the fight. Anyway, Sam, like I say, you are spun a pretty good yarn. Every liar does. With all my love and respect, Mark. P.S. Be sure to circulate this letter to the others. <laughs> he ate that. I'm sorry. Mark kind of ate that shit up. Ooh. He kind of, ooh. P.S. Be sure to cir circulate this letter with the others. I'm dead. I'm dead. That kind of ate down. I don't know. I mean, I know I'm like on like the kind of Sam and Ellis camp right now. But like with that letter alone, I'm moving in the middle. And mind you, my voting is based entirely off of vibe and not on fact. So don't think I'm actually I don't look who fucking right. Who fucking knows the truth? Like when it comes to family feuds, everyone's fucking lying, by the way. Everyone fucking lies their asses off. But that letter kind of ate down. OK. Ellis had observed Joe in action for years and believed that when Joe accused someone of doing something, it was because Joe was threatening to do it or thinking of it. Joe had accused Sam of enriching himself with sweetheart deals when Ellis believed it had been Joe who was doing that, as, the, as was the case of form builders. He said Sam hated him when it was Joe who hated Sam. Joe had accused Sam of tax irregularities in his family estate, and Ellis believed if there were any irregularities, they would be discovered in Joe's estate finances. And Joe falsely claimed the outside group intended to dismantle and destroy U-Haul when it was he who was dismantling it and who, in Ellis's opinion, would destroy the company if he remained in charge. Okay? We get it. We got it. We're following. All this talk of guns and shooting taken in that context was very disturbing. Apparently, Joe had mentioned it a lot. 
there had been a troubling moment of sobering insight during Ellis's private meeting with his psychologist. The psychologist was advising Ellis on what he should and should not do about Joe and Mark. The psychologist had told Ellis to understand that he could not satiate Joe's and Mark's hunger for power. I can't speak. Hunger for power. Okay, hunger. No, no, no. Hunger. Quote, they are like a wounded animal in the corner who tended to not to care when they were engaged in a struggle and they can easily turn to revenge. Then, as a word of caution, the psychologist told Ellis, quote, when they are very seriously defeated, they will get a gun. End quote. Foreshadowing. Back to Sam and Ava. For some time, Sam and Ava had complained of the summer heat in Phoenix, where obviously U-Haul's headquarters were and still are, a phenomenon known as desert fatigue. They had skied in many locations over the years and decided to look for a residence away from Phoenix that offered skiing in the winter and a vigorous outdoor life in the summer. They selected Telluride, Colorado, and brought a spot, a spacious, comfortable log cabin in an exclusive estate just outside the small town. They began making regular trips up to escape, frankly, not just that summer's heat, but the family feud as well. The fact that Joe had told Mary Anna he planned to start carrying a gun still weighed heavily on Sam's mind. Mary Anna, okay, as you may recall, you're like, what, the wife of Ellis who's passed? Yes. Obviously, they had a daughter and they named her Mary Anna, okay? Younger daughter, one of the younger sisters, all right? And Joe had told Mariana that he was carrying a gun and then Mariana told Sam, okay, because as sisters, like, we we play both sides. Okay, we play both sides. Um, and, and Sam got a little stressed, getting a little stressed, okay, a little stress rude about that, okay? A disturbing incident at about this time also motivated Sam to move. It was Ava and Sam's practice in their Paradise Valley home not to pull the drapes at night since the house was set off on a secluded lot. One evening, Sam was napping upstairs when a stranger simply walked into the house, quote, Do what I tell you, he said, and no one will get hurt. Ava responded coolly by calling out for her husband, quote, Sam, there's someone here. Get the gun. In fact, they had no gun. But hearing his wife, Sam knew there was trouble, and he bolted from the bedroom in his skivvies without glasses, which meant he was virtually blind, same, and charged, stumbling down the stairs, shouting, quote, I'm coming. I've got the gun. I'll shoot the son of a bitch, end quote. They really knew their knew their characters and knew right they they knew he knew immediately what to say if i had screamed like get the gun to any one of my family okay if they were here or not there's no way that they would immediately fall into position right get down the eight count they would say they'd be like what we don't have one what's wrong what's going on like it would it would it fuck it they would fuck up the whole routine we'd be fucked so i commend i commend sam for saying that if that did indeed happen good for him he got he got it together. The stranger was so frightened he bolted out of the house straight through the front window, but the episode caused Sam concern about the safety of big city life. The pristine beauty and quiet congeniality of Telluride was a strong magnet and among the reasons he and Ava selected it as their retreat. Not long after the intruder incident, Ava participated in self-defense training sponsored by the Young Presidents Organization in which Sam was a prominent member. Ava made a point to tell her women-in-laws that she had learned self-defense and urged them to be trained in it as well. By the summer of 1990, Sam and Ava were well settled into their lives of quiet domesticity in Telluride. In Phoenix, Sam was subjected to constant abuse, but here in the Colorado mountains, they had found a sanctuary. Ava's parents were aging and Sam agreed to an extended vacation in Norway. Before leaving, he re- wrote his will. His shares in U-Haul were held in a trust. Under the old will in the event of his death, control of those shares was were to pass to the head of U-Haul's in-house insurance company, a man whom Sam had once trusted but who was now one of the Golden Five on Joe's team and would be expected to vote the shares with Joe. He changed the provision so that Ava could vote his stock should he die. For a moment, he considered making this change in the circumstances, in his circumstances known to you, Hall, but he was so angry with what was going on that he decided against it. For him, it was a private decision. So no one knew that. Okay. Everyone at you, Halsey, everyone, all the siblings, all the sibs and shit thought that, yes, indeed, if if Sam was was passed, if Sam was not of this world, that his shares in the company would go to uh, the in-house counsel, insurance counsel, and that. Uh, and he was presently on, on, on Joe's team. Okay, great. 
Awesome. Glad we are caught up with that important factor. Now, the day, the night, I should say, that Ava was murdered, Sam was expected to be there. Okay. He was not due in Phoenix until the next day, but he had unexpectedly decided to drive to Phoenix uh, a few days before to prepare for a presentation that he was giving. Okay. Who would have thunk? So as we've already recounted, Ava is murdered with a shot to the back and her children find her in the morning. Um, they call the police and the investigation begins. Ava was murdered in 1990. Okay. After her murder, Leonard, okay, Ellis Schoen and his son, Sam, and some of their other family members who were in their camp, right, in the two teams on their team, the red team, the blue team, they basically put out a reward, a $250,000 reward for anyone with information leading to the arrest of someone, a suspect, um, in, the, in the murder, uh, involved in the murder of Ava Schoen. And they also kind of went on a bit of a media campaign, okay? They were fed the fuck up. They threw down the towel and said, you know what? Fuck Joe and Mark. We think they had something to do with this. Let's 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 start brawling via verbiage in the public, okay? Which can get y'all into trouble sometimes. They um, ended up convincing Unsolved Mysteries, like an Unsolved Mysteries type show. I think it was kind of like a spinoff situation, okay? Um, to do an episode on Ava, on Ava and her murder. Um, and in the episode, they did some interviews in which it was very much heavily implied by Ellis and Sam, if not directly stated that they thought that Joe and Mark had something to do with this, that they hired a contract killer, that that that's how it went down. OK, also um, a book started started pending, started being in process. OK, um, around this time. All right. Pretty much immediately after Ava was murdered, an investigative journalist named Ronald Watkins, OK, investigative author of books on on topical and controversial subjects. He he was like, let me test the waters. Let me test the air. Um, It's time for me to do an expose. And he reached out. OK, he reached out to to Leonard, to Ellis and and to his son, Sam, and said, hey, do you want to get in on this? I also kind of think that Joan Mark did it. And and they were like, yes, if we have some royalties, we'll give you some we'll give you some hard dirt, some very detailed letters, some correspondence, basically every nitty gritty dramatic detail about the family. OK, the dirty laundry, if you will, uh, for the from the last, you know, 30, 40 years, we're going to give to you for a little bit of royalties and a little bit of shit talk about about Joe and Mark. Amazing. Perfect. Beautiful. Gorgeous. Um, yeah, so that book starts coming along, okay, has not been published yet, all right, but obviously, um, Joe and Mark find out about it, okay, pretty rapidly. I can only imagine that this investigative author is reaching out to some peeps who who are in the camp of the camp of Joe and Mark, okay, the jark. And, and so they're pissed, all right, they're pissed. There's several lawsuits ongoing related to the U-Haul, Americo, uh, you know, 8,000 shares, scheme, schema ream, um, and, and other shit, okay, going on <laughs> between and among everyone. Um, Ellis also filed a lawsuit regarding his pension being canceled, his, his employment contract being canceled by, by Joe and Mark, um, even though he was entitled to it for, for life. Uh, they canceled it because they were, it just says a fuck you, essentially. Um, you know the vibes, you know the, you know, you know the bullshit. Um, so, Another lawsuit hits the docket, all right, and it's called, you guessed it, Shone versus Shone. And the case that I'm going to read from is, is the appeal that took place in that case. So this, this case is Shone versus Shone, an opinion coming out of the Ninth Circuit, September 27th, 1993, okay? So essentially, something happened in the lower case at the lower level in the federal district court, and um, Ronald J. Watkins, the investigative author, appealed, and it went up to the Ninth Circuit. OK, so let's see what the hullabaloo, the, the hullabaloo was about. This appeal presents the question on whether an investigative author at work on a forthcoming book may be compelled to testify and produce notes and tape recordings of interviews he conducted with a source who happens to be a defendant in a defamation action. You you can guess what what's going on here. OK, the defamation action 
was obviously um, Joan Mark against their dad and Ellis and and yeah. All right. Primarily against them, not against the investigative author, but against primarily Ellis and, and Sam, because they were the ones who made statements on this show. And, um, you know, presumably we're going to be making these statements again in the forthcoming book. OK, because it had not been published yet. So they weren't suing Ronald Watkins for defamation for statements he hasn't made yet. You can't do that. You can't you can't do a presumptive defamation situation. OK, it has to be that the defamation, the defamatory statements were actually made and, and made to a third party. OK, the third party published, published, meaning like made to a third party out there in the world um, and 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 to, to anyone other than just like talking to yourself. You know what I mean? You can should talk anyone to yourself 150 percent. Just make sure you're not recorded or sending a voice memo to others. Anyhow, <laughs> there's your legal advice for the day. So this is what the court said, okay? Appellant Ronald Watkins is an investigated author of books on topical and controversial subjects. He became involved in this defamation action because of his work on a forthcoming nonfiction book about a long and bitter family feud over control of the highly successful U-Haul company, a feud pitting the patriarch of the family and founder of U-Haul, Ellis Schoen, against two of his sons, Mark and Joe Schoen. In the midst of these family quarrels, Ava Berg Schoen, the wife of Leonard's eldest son, Sam, was found brutally murdered in her family's log cabin in Telluride, Colorado. The murder remains unsolved as of September 27, 1993. We'll get into it. Following Ava's murder, Watkins, the author of two previous investigative books on issues of current interest, secured a contract with a major publisher to write a book about the Schoen family, its battles over control of U-Haul and the murder of Ava Schoen. The book, entitled Birthright, is slated for publication in late 1993. Leonard agreed, Ellis, shown. God, now they're saying Leonard. It's like pick a card. You know what I mean? Pick a fucking card. L it's either L dot S dot or Leonard. Oh, my God. Ellis, Ellis, Ellis. Ellis, shown, agreed to cooperate with Watkins by providing source material for the book in exchange for a share of future royalties. Watkins then conducted a number of research interviews with Ellis, some of which were tape recorded by Watkins. Ellis's cooperation as a source for Watkins's book was not kept secret, nor does it appear that Ellis had any expectation that the information he provided Watkins would remain confidential. Meanwhile, Mark and Joe Schoen, the two sons at war with Ellis over U-Haul, brought this defamation action against their father, alleging that he made public statements linking them to the murder of their sister-in-law, Ava. Among the statements Joe and Mark alleged to be defamatory are the following examples. Number one, in a telephone interview from his home in Las Vegas, Ellis Schoen said he believes his two sons are mentally ill and that he suspects they are indirectly connected to the killing of Ava. This was published by the Associated Press Wire Service on or after August 23rd, 1990. Number two, quote, the murder of Ava Schoen was an assassination. Leonard Schoen, Ellis Schoen, suggested to authorities that the killing might be related to a long-running family feud over control of the company, which has close to a billion dollars in annual sales, end quote. This quote was published in the Los Angeles Times on September 4th, 1990. Number three, Ellis Schoen said, quote, I don't know this for a fact, but I am convinced that these sons, either one or both of them, directly or indirectly are responsible for this. My son Sam was to be hit. He was to be removed from the picture, and I think these two young men, my young sons, either programmed other people to believe this or else had done it themselves, end quote. This was published on the television program Hard Copy on October 2nd, 1990. Number four, the questioner says, quote, do you think that your sons truly could have hired someone to kill their brother and thus his wife? Leonard so Ellis Schoen says, quote, Yes, I do. I believe that they could have by hiring the killer themselves or by indirectly creating an environment where someone around them would think that the thing to do is to get rid of Sam for them and they will do him a big favor, end quote. That was published by KTVK KTV on November 2nd, 1990. Number five, quote, Ellis Schoen has continued to push two theories of the crime. One that suggests Joe or Mark hired the killers and one which someone allied with their brothers and U-Haul management decided to kill, eliminate Sam. Either way, he says, I believe one or both of these sons are indirectly responsible for Ava's death, end quote. That was published in the Los Angeles Times on February 17th, 1991. 
So y'all are gathering, right? We have some statements. We have some defamatory states statements, okay? Now, to back it up and understand defamation, okay, what that is, obviously, if you can imagine, not every shit talk that you say about some someone um, is necessarily defamation, okay? Uh, a defamatory statement does have a definition, um, and, and it very much does have to meet a, a standard of proof and then sometimes a higher standard of proof if you are a public figure, which I will get into, okay? Um, as an aside, I did um, a very uh, complicated, not really complicated, but high stakes, high, high, highly competitive moot court competition um, in Chicago when I was in law school, my third year of law school. Um, and the issue was uh, a defamation issue with a limited purpose public figure. And you basically just have to become a niche um or I guess you have to become an expert on a very niche area of law very quickly. Uh, and so I just happened to be an, a mild expert on a very niche area of law. And that is um, public figures and defamation, which is like, you know, you would think doesn't come up that much. It kind of has lately, kind of has lately. Um, but right. Defamation is state by state. Depends on the state that you are in. Um, what law will like what what type of defamation law will apply. Um, but. It's pretty much the same everywhere um, with just like a little, little tiny differences. Under Arizona law, in order to recover damages from defamation, you have to prove that one, the individual made a false statement concerning you. Okay, it has to be false and you have to prove that it's false. All right. This seems simpler than it is. Sometimes it's not. Okay. Has to, you have to prove, prove that it's false by preponderance of the evidence. Okay. Second, you have to prove that this statement was defamatory. The word defamatory means that not just that it's false, but that it tends to harm someone's reputation, okay? Sometimes saying false shit, that might be hurtful to you, okay? That might you might think is like, oh, that's so fucked up. Like just because someone says that they think you drive a Honda, okay? Or like, oh, they drive a Honda, like uh, implying that you're broke, whatever. And you're like, I'm, I drive a Beamer. That's so fucked up. Like that's not necessarily defamatory because it's not really going to tend to harm your reputation in like a, in like a substantial degree. Okay. In like a way that would be, um, harmful, uh, to a reasonable person, it would be harmful. Like under our society standards, standards would actually be harmful to your reputation in like a very personal or public professional way. Okay. For example, there's like a legitimate like list of things that are like per se defamatory. One of them being like you have a very um, you have a venereal disease, like saying that someone has a venereal disease is like we've just said, yeah, that that's fucking that's defamatory. Like we're not even going to get into it. That's defamatory. Saying someone um, has committed like certain very horrible crimes. That's defamatory um, per se. Uh, saying that someone um, like it it's typically anything to do with like someone's sexual, um, like, na like, like really bizarre, like things that they've engaged in sexually, like that is seen as, right? Like you're, you're, you're understanding, you're getting it. Oh, also saying someone, um, is not good at their job in the sense that like it would be extremely harmful. So like if someone lied and said that, um, you know, a, a doctor committed malpractice, but it was like widespread and like, like things, things kind of like that. And it would like harm their professional rep. Okay. Can be defamatory. I'm not saying that that, that my example was, was perfect always, but you're understanding, right. That defamatory is kind of a higher standard than just lies. Okay. So you have to show that it was a false statement concerning you, that it was defamatory, that it was published. Okay. To a third party published doesn't just mean like literally like written on a piece of paper. It means basically like transmitted to anyone else. Okay. To a third party. It could be one person. It could be 20 people. It doesn't matter to a third party. Okay. Anyone other than the two people who are involved. Okay. The speaker and the person who's being defamed. Right. Then you have to show that you were actually damaged by that publication. Okay. You can't just be like, it hurt my feels like, yes, that could potentially be like an emotional distress incident situation, but like you have to show that you were damaged. Okay. Um, that, those are the elements for if it's a private person, a private person meaning someone who is not a public figure. All right. So like you, most people listening to this, okay. I'm not going to like speak on who listens to this podcast. Love you so much, but like, you're probably a private person. Okay. You're probably a private, going to be considered a private person for purposes of a def defamation action. Okay. So, um, you know, 
broad strokes wise, uh, you could potentially become a public figure. All right. If you, for example, um, thrust yourself. I know that's like an awkward word to use, but that's like quite literally the word that I had to repeat 80 million times in this fucking competition. Okay. <laughs> um, to talk about defamation and limited purpose public figures and general purpose public figures. Limited purpose public figures, okay, are those who have voluntarily thrust themselves into a public controversy for purposes of comment on that controversy or or um, engagement, participation, whatever, okay, involvement. And they have thus subjected themselves to potentially, um, you know, public statements or, or you know, public, publicated, published statements about them with respect to that con controversy, okay? So... A general purpose public figure, if you can imagine, right, is is someone who's a public figure for pretty much all fucking purposes. An example of this would be the president. OK, an example of this would be um, many celebrities that, you know, OK, even though, yes, they may be movie stars, um, they have subjected themselves to being a public figure. Their job is being a public figure. They're, they're a public figure. Um, so it is much harder um, to prove defamation or to win on a defamation claim and get damages because once you become a public figure, okay, you have to show actual malice. In addition to all of those elements, there's an extra element added on which says that you have to prove that the statement, the defamatory statements were made by the people, okay, published to others with reckless disregard for the truth, uh, with knowledge of its falsity, malice in the sense that they 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 knew shit wasn't kosher and they did it anyway because they wanted to hurt you. That's like the bare bones way to explain it. Um, if you're a lawyer or a law student, you're like, um, it's not exactly good. Can you just fuck off? Thank you. <laughs> that is the standard that you have to prove when you are a public figure or determined to be a leg legally defined public figure for purposes of a defamation action and want to prevail on a defamation claim. Okay. Against someone. So, so an example, all right. An example of, of what comes up a lot now with social media and with, with TikTok and everything that, that is interesting. And that has really changed the landscape of a lot of defamation issues and defamation law and, and, and cases, which are still ongoing and developing is that, you know, back in the nineties. Okay. And before that, it was pretty easy to distinguish between a public figure and someone who isn't right. Just because someone, um, you know, is popular in the town doesn't necessarily mean that they're a public figure. Okay. Public figures like big, right. It was kind of like, Oh, a very it, it, public figures were seen as like, Oh, celebrities, politicians, da, da, da. okay. People like that movie stars. Okay. Limited purpose public figures though, were, were more so defined as like, Oh, someone who's like maybe um, on the board of like a local community college. So, so they are a limited purpose public figure for purposes of their role in that, in, in, in their community college, things. Okay. But if someone's just saying random things about them, about their personal life, about things like that, as opposed to like maybe their ability to do their job on the board, like that, that those statements that involve stuff that's completely irrelevant from their limited purpose, public figure life, those might be private citizen. Okay. Standard type defamation claims, but for purposes of their role on the board statements relating to that, probably going to have to prove actual malice because they're a limited purpose public figure. Okay. Do you understand why it's like a very fact sensitive, like the court has to figure out, okay, which one is it? Right. Now enter social media. Okay. Enter TikTok, Instagram. When someone has a million followers on Instagram, on TikTok, and they post about their life, are statements made by, um, a news article, a publication, speculating, making making statements that are lies that are tend to be defamatory about their private life, are those subject to that higher actual malice standard? Because they have voluntarily thrust their personal life into the public sphere, okay? And they've even more so made their public life, or I mean made their personal life, a, a controversy, a public controversy question mark. It depends, right? It would depend. It's very fact sensitive. It would depend, but like it, it gets dicey. Um, you know, I think that case by case is, is obviously, I mean, it's not even just, I think, I think it's like the way the law is applied. It's very case by case. You cannot, uh, create 
a broad strokes rule that can apply to everyone and every defamation action ever and every statement ever made against any person who has any level of social media literacy and 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 presence. But uh, you can understand why this is sketch, okay? And this it's Nick sketch, meaning like this has become something that the law is trying to fucking figure out and untangle because uh, it would very much seem like um, limited purpose public figure would apply to a lot more people than what was maybe intended when we created that middle ground between general general P and P. <laughs> general P and Priv. General P and Priv, okay? That makes sense. Cool. We are in the 90s though, okay, as I stated, as I said. Um, so the these issues aren't really aren't really happening. They're not really risen yet. They have not risen like Jesus on a Sunday on Easter. Um, they are still brewing, they're still pending. We have not had the internet age boom, boom shakalaka, tick the ticker talker, the ticker talker has not entered uh, our feed. So yeah, it's pretty easy to figure out who's a lim- limited purpose P and who's a general purpose P and who's a private P. Private C. Private says citizen there's your defamation rundown you're welcome or not if you're gonna bitch him on and complain i don't really care just remember all the statements that ellis made that they're basically alleging okay are the defamatory statements forming the basis for their complaint okay because in a defamation case you do have to fucking say the statement you can't just be like hey promise pinky swear it was just really mean like no you have to say the statement Notice that all of those statements that Ellis made are all ones that weren't made to this author, right? They're because obviously the book hasn't been published yet. Okay, that shit has not been published. Okay, these are all statements made to reporters and newspaper articles that basically form the basis for their claims. Mark and Joe do not claim that their father made any of his allegedly defamatory statements to Watkins. However, as part of their pretrial discovery, plaintiffs served Watkins with a subpoena ordering him to appear at a deposition testify and produce any notes, documents, electronic recordings, or any other records in his possession, quote, relating to the death of Ava Berg shown, end quote. After failing to obtain a protective order under Arizona's statutory press shield law, Watkins appeared at the scheduled deposition but refused to produce any documents or recordings or to answer any questions concerning the substance of his interviews with Leonard Schoen. When plaintiffs filed a motion to compel production of documents and testimony, Watkins responded with a motion to quash on the ground that compulsory disclosure of his interviews with Leonard Schoen, Ellis Schoen, would violate his qualified First Amendment privilege as a journalist. Dicey stuff. The district court, so the lower court, denied Watkins's motion to quash and granted the plaintiff's motion to compel, ruling that Watkins, as an investigative author, had standing to invoke the journalist's privilege, but that in the particular circumstances of this case, the qualified privilege must yield to the plaintiff's litigation needs. Whatever that means. The court ordered Watkins to testify about all of the, quote, communications by Ellis Schoen to Mr. Watkins and to produce such materials as may memorialize those communications, end quote. The scope of this court's order, of the district court's order, later became a matter of dispute. In a telephone conference, the court stated that the plaintiffs were entitled to, quote, each and every method, mode, scrap of paper, computer disk, note, recollection, shred of evidence that would evidence Ellis Schoen's communications to Watkins on matters concerning the murder, the family feud, and any statements made as to the plaintiffs, Mark and Joe Schoen, themselves. That is broad as hell. That is so fucking broad. As an attorney, I'm like itching to be like, what in the fuck? When Watkins refused to appear at the second deposition, the district court held him in contempt. Watkins now appeals the contempt order on the ground that the discovery order compelling him to divulge all that Ellis Schoen told him for use in his book violates his qualified First Amendment privilege as a journalist. How does the Ninth Circuit rule? Okay, the Ninth Circuit uh, takes this appeal and says, okay, let's hear it. Let's see what we're going to say about all of this. The issues that the court is going to unpack and unravel are are kind of twofold, okay? Two legal questions. First, does an investigative book author have standing to invoke the journalist's privilege, okay, that we're thinking of in terms of like a literal like CNN reporter, a Fox News reporter, right? You're thinking of that kind of journalist. Does an investigative author does an investigative author have that same that same privy to invoke? 
And number two, does the journalist's privilege protect information and materials obtained without a guarantee of confidentiality? Okay, so essentially, like, does the journalist's privilege still apply when an interview is given and that person knew that that shit was going to be published in this book, right? Like, they knew that. There was no, like, we promised to, link, make it secret, keep it secret. You know, like, with a lot of... um informants on the inside to journalists about political you know factions and and parties oftentimes the journalists will be like i'm not telling you who my source is but my sources say right that's the type of my sources say like they know that their name is going to be pr kept private in this instance ellis's name was not going to be kept private they weren't going to be like we heard from a source that his dad said this like no the dad was like this is what i fucking said okay in the book that's what he's gonna say with respect to the first issue what does the court say well the plaintiffs argued okay that watkins investigative author has no standing to invoke the journalist privilege because book authors are not members of the institutionalized print or broadcast meter media and the ninth circuit court disagrees okay they say no good a try good try all right but no cheese nope we disagree he can invoke this privilege all right um the critical question is not whether they're in broadcast media or a literal reporter. The critical question for whether you can invoke the journalistic privilege is whether a person is gathering news for dissemination to the public. Okay, that's the test. Investigative author, he's putting out a book about this family feud, about this very public, very intense, you know what I mean? Like situation this murder da, da, okay high profile uh yeah that that fucking qualifies uh the long the court said the long-standing feud over control of the u-haul trucking empire and the murder of ava shown are absolutely things that you can disseminate information about okay that can allow you to have the journalistic privilege and so accordingly watkins has standing to invoke the journalist privilege period that is issue number one now Second issue, whether Watkins is barred from invoking the journalist's privilege to shield the information he obtained from Ellis Schoen because the information was not obtained, obtained under a promise of confidentiality, meaning keeping that shit secret or keeping the uh, identity of that person secret. Okay. And this is where many broad strokes, First Amendment, public policy type um, things, okay, like foundational principles of our democracy and things like start coming into play. Okay. And I, th these quotes from case law that that the court cited uh, pretty much sums it the fuck up. The compelled production of a reporter's resource materials can constitute a significant intrusion into the news gathering. Wow. The compelled quote, the compelled production of a reporter's resource materials can constitute a significant intrusion into the news gathering and editorial processes. Like the compelled disclosure of confidential sources, it may substantially undercut the public policy favoring the free flow of information that is the foundation for the privilege. In another case, quote, the relationship between the journalist and his source may be confidential or non-confidential for purposes of the privilege and, quote, unpublished resource material likewise may be protected. The court noted a, quote, lurking and subtle threat to the vitality of a free press if disclosure of non-confidential information becomes routine and casually, if not cavalierly, compelled. The court reasoned, quote, to the extent that compelled disclosure becomes commonplace, it seems likely indeed that internal policies of destruction of materials may be devised and choices as to subject matter made, which could be keyed to avoiding disclosure requests or compliance therewith rather than to the basic function of providing news and comment. In addition, frequency of subpoenas would not only preempt the otherwise productive time of journalists and other employees, but measurably increase expenditures for legal fees. The compelled disclosure of non-confidential information harms the press's ability to gather information by damaging confidential sources' trust and the press's capacity to keep secrets and, in a broader sense, by converting the press and the public's mind into an investigative arm of prosecutors and the courts. It is their independent status that often enables reporters to gain access without a pledge of confidentiality to meetings or places where a policeman or a politician would not be welcome. If perceived as an adjunct of the police or of the courts, journalists might well be shunned by persons who might otherwise give them information without a promise of confidentiality, barred from meetings which they would otherwise be free to attend and to describe or even physically harassed if, for example, observed taking notes or photographs at a public rally. 
I love when the law makes more sense than half of the fucking general fucking public. God fucking damn. Makes sense, right? Makes fucking sense. If a subpoena is the only bridge and gap between a journalist and the literal 5 or like the lawsuit, the product, whatever, like the courts, then like what is the di- Like there's no difference. Okay. There's no difference. There's just an extra step, a very expensive, extra litigious step. Okay. So ultimately the court decided that Watkins had properly invoked the privilege on the facts of this case. And now they just had to determine whether um, the interest, right, the plaintiff's need for this information outweighed the First Amendment interests at stake that Watkins held. Um, And they obviously ultimately held that no, it didn't. They said plaintiff's failure to depose Ellis shown, okay, literally, like why the fuck are you deposing this author before you're put, deposing Ellis, like the information that you want, like the information that you want, you want someone to like testify to. Okay. You should talk to Ellis first, kind of, you know what I mean? Like what the fuck, like have him, if you want him to lie, uh, lie on the stand, then like, like th- that's the thing is that you gotta, you gotta be strategic about this shit or the court will be like be FFR, like be fucking for real. Plaintiff's failure to depose Ellis shown before pursuing Watkins highlights an important distinction between this case and another case the court mentions, uh, a case called Farr, okay? In Farr, a trial judge sought disclosure from a third-party journalist to determine which of the attorneys in a celebrated murder case had violated a gag order by leaking a witness statement to the journalist. The journalist was ordered to disclose his source only after the court held a series of hearings at which each of the attorneys still alive denied under oath that he was the source of the leak. And... Those statements were published already, okay? At that point, the only untapped source for the wrongdoer's entity identity was the journalist. Here, in contrast, by failing to depose Ellis Schoen, plaintiffs have failed to exhaust the most patently available other source. So essentially, the court is like, look, if you even want to consider, okay, fucking up this privilege, you know, going beyond the privilege, saying, no, sorry, like, we want your source, you got to tap the fucking other sources. And even then, okay, even fucking then, if this is the last source left, it still has to, um, like, the, the, the benefit or the interest in finding out the, the information that you have to say, okay, has to outweigh uh, the First Amendment interest that the journalist has and holds. And that's, like, a high interest, okay, obviously. Um, so, essentially, the court said in sum, it is too early in the discovery process for Watkins's journalist privilege to yield. And so holding, we do not say that plaintiffs will never be able to un- overcome the presumption in favor of the privilege. We only say that they have failed to provide a sufficiently compelling reason to do so at this stage of the litigation. So Watkins was not required and not compelled um, to, to testify. He was no longer held in contempt. Okay. The district court's order was reversed. Um, on, on literally every fucking front. <laughs> they were like, yes, you can hold the privilege. Yes, you know, like it, it doesn't, it, it basically stands strong. Um, so all of you are probably wondering, okay, we get it. Your legal mind loves the defamatory shit. Can we get to like all the other shit going on? Like what happened? What happened? What happened? Okay, I'll tell you. So the one of the main cases, one of the main lawsuits that came out of this was obviously the Americo, the lawsuit against Americo, okay, for the, sketchy joe's sketchy you know selling eight thousand shares to try to get voting power and he got it and he you know initiated the coup d'etat and threw out sam and ellis okay that case actually resulted in a jury verdict in 1994 in favor of uh ellis and sam okay against u-haul against americo against joe all right a verdict of 1.47 billion with a B dollars was awarded, okay, against you all with a B billy, okay? You, like, you took the L where it has never gone before, all right? It was ultimately reduced after the fact uh, to 500 million, but like, remember how I mentioned how U-Haul was in the fucking hole, like around like the 90s, you know what I mean? Like in the hole by like 600 milli, okay? Like this probably did not help, okay? This probably didn't fucking help. Yeah, they lost big, okay? Joe was even said in an interview with news reporter after the verdict was rendered, he was like, he was surprised. Like he definitely thought that he could do that shit. He could do the little finagling voting power shit and like he could not, he could not, Um, he could not. You're probably wondering about Ava, Ava's murder. Was it ever solved what happened? Well, actually, after the, um, you know, Unsolved Mysteries episode aired, okay, about this, about her murder um, and and the $250,000 reward and all public attention on this case, um, that actually helped in 
in uh, having someone come forward. Okay, this man, uh, his name is Marquise. He came forward and bench- and basically like confessed uh, to the killing, claiming it was a completely unrelated burglary that he wanted to commit. Um, he was in the neighborhood. He was a felon. Okay, he was like on parole or something, and 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 killed her. Allegedly, a random act. He also testified that it was not and in, in, in no way connected to to Joe and Mark, and that he was not in cahoots with anyone to to commit the killing. Like he basically testified to that. And so he pled guilty and he served time. He's like serving like twenty years or so. Right? Doesn't that seem kind of weird? You're like unrelated. Hmm. So as you can imagine, after that happened, um, okay. There are many of people within the Ellis and Sam faction that still believe to this day that Marquise was not the one who did it, or even if he was the one who did it, like he didn't act alone. Like he was definitely, definitely somehow a benefit, somehow received a benefit. Okay, somehow hired to do this, um, and 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 also that that the target was intended to be Sam and not Ava. But neither here nor there. Okay, we don't know. But under the law, someone's doing time for that murder, okay, in Colorado, which is horrible. I mean, she left behind her children. Like, it's just awful and horrible and 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 very fucked. Okay, this whole family drama is very fucked. Um, with respect to Ellis, okay, he basically uh, became pretty fucking broke, okay? Pretty fucking broke, uh, especially after... His son took away his lifetime pension that was supposed to go hit his bank account until he died. Um, he left Phoenix because he just wanted to be away from the family troubles because that's where everyone was. Um, and he ended up moving to Las Vegas. Very sad uh, in so much litigation up to his fucking ears. Okay. Um, and he ended up committing suicide. He took his own life by crashing his car into a, into a pole in 1999 or 1998, somewhere around there. Like, holy shit, okay? With all 12 of his kids hating each other, okay? And and his whole family enterprise at that point kind of in the in the red, okay? U-Haul ultimately ended up filing for bankruptcy at one point. But filing for bankruptcy doesn't necessarily mean that you're like, you know, gone as a company forever. It can mean that you, you do a little rebound and obviously they're still around and doing well. So, so yeah, they did. Um, litigation, which I won't bore you with because there's like a bajillion cases as I told you, all of this litigation that kind of started in 1990 did not end until 2012. I think I mentioned that kind of in the beginning, but like until fucking 2012, like that's when a settlement was reached by and between some of these family members. Like you're fucking kidding. Okay. This shit was going on until 2012. Like if you type in shown versus shown, there are cases from 1992, 1993 and 2012. Like that's obscene. Okay. Um, Yes, Joe runs the company. Joe's coup still stood, still stands, okay? Joe is the head honcho. Joe is the head honcho. He has very much stays out of the public eye, okay? He's done uh, like very little, very few interviews. The most recent one was uh, an article in Forbes that basically talks about uh, his like day-to-day life uh, working the company and how he has like a direct line to his phone for customers to call with complaints and things um, and how he very much, you know, has uh, has has stayed out of the public eye because of all the family drama, but just kept his head down, down and ran the company. And and he he won. Right. Like, if you really think about it, like he won. He got what he wanted. Uh, he was not the favorite child. Uh, uh, Ellis did not want Joe or Mark to run the company and Joe and Mark said no thank you we're changing the rules we're changing the rules so (laughs) that is the U-Haul family clusterfuck the family saga the family feud that that only recently ended bet you didn't know that about your U-Haul trailers about your moving buddies So next time you rent a U-Haul, next time you see a U-Haul, next time you are pushing a too heavy couch up your friend's third story walk up, think. Think about starting a franchise, starting a dynasty. And my rebuttal for this case, for this episode, is if you want to start a family dynasty, a family dynasty, 
um, that doesn't get die nasty, uh, maybe consider birth control. Maybe consider a condom once in a while. That's all from me. Love you guys so much. Follow us on YouTube. Watch us on YouTube. Follow us. Follow me, Red Maisel, on TikTok. Red Maisel on Instagram. Robotopod on Instagram. Post updates there. I love you guys. Thank you for bearing with me during the hiatus. I am happy to be back. And we will see you next week with episode 16, which is going to it's gonna get a little hot. Love you. Love you. Bye.